Hello and welcome. March is Endometriosis Awareness Month. You are at the right place. We will be talking about first line approach to endometriosis related infertility. Our panelists will debate out the pros and cons of surgery versus art. ART, sorry. I am Sarah Ramaya, Curriculum Design Strategist and Webinar Coordinator at ASRM. Before we begin, please note, this webinar was developed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While this webinar reflects the views of the panelists, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to dictate an exclusive course of treatment. Members should always use their best judgment in determining a course of action and be guided by the needs of the individual patient, available resources, and institutional or clinical practice limit limitations. All attendees, please note, you will be muted except the presenters. This is an interactive discussion, so please type a question in the Q&A window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the panelists. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ESRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for a notification. Our moderator for today's session is Dr. Alexander Quas. Dr. Quas is Division Director of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University Hospital Basel, Switzerland. I will now turn the discussion over to Dr. Quas. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to uh, be a part of this and to moderate this. Uh, we are excited to have two uh, very expert speakers on the topic of endometriosis and infertility. And the outline for today's uh, webinar is to, uh, after a short introduction into the relationship of endometriosis and infertility, have Dr. Bruce Lessey talk, talk about endometriosis as an unrecognized cause of IVF failure. After that, Dr. John Petroza will talk about the role of surgery in the treatment of endometriosis related infertility. And then we'll have a case discussion and a Q&A session. Dr. Bruce Lassie is a professor at Wake Forest Baptist Health in Winston-Salem, North, Carol North Carolina. He's a physician scientist with a longstanding interest in basic and translational research on endometrial function. He's also conducted NIH-funded research on endometriosis, including non-invasive detection. Dr. John Petroza is Chief of the Division of Reproductive Medicine and IVF at Mass General Hospital, co-director of the MGH Integrated Fibroid Program, and he has a strong focus on surgical aspects of infertility and reproduction, including the surgical treatment of endometriosis. Importantly, he was also a surgical mentor for me in residency, and I learned a lot from him. <clears throat> so regarding the relationship of endometriosis and infertility, a lot of us in residency or at other times of their training have come across the committee opinion on endometriosis and infertility. In this document, uh, the introduction states that 25 to 50% of infertile women have endometriosis and 30 to 50% of women with endometriosis are infertile. The prevalence of endometriosis in women undergoing laparoscopy for evaluation of infertility is somewhere between nine and 50%. The prevalence of endometriosis among women with pelvic pain is 30 to 80%. The normal, quote unquote, fecundity rate in the general population is 15 to 20 percent and is estimated to be about 2 to 10 percent, so the lower than in the general population in patients with endometriosis. So there is an association uh, between endometriosis and infertility, which has been clearly demonstrated. The causal relationship is less clear. The effects of endometriosis on reproduction have been researched extensively. This figure is from a review article by Dominic de Ziegler et al. And it shows the potential effects of endometriosis on reproduction in different parts of the reproductive system. 
In the pelvic cavity, you can see that there are inflammatory changes in the peritoneal fluid, proliferation of macrophages and phagocytic dysfunction, release of pro-inflammatory and angiogenic factors, and changes in the peritoneal fluid that can affect the sperm and oocyte interaction. In the uterus, there's activation of stereogenic factor one and aromatase with production of estrogen in, C2, in situ, resistance to progesterone, which uh, Dr. Lassie has done extensive research about, and changes that may affect the endometrium itself. In the ovaries, the functional ovarian tissue or the ovarian reserve may be reduced by endometriomas or by surgery, and the response to controlled ovarian hyperstimulation and ART has been shown to be hampered. The management of infertility associated with endometriosis is the topic of this webinar today. So obviously the basic two management options of a patient with endometriosis desiring fertility or desiring to conceive is to either proceed with surgery to try and increase her chances of conceiving or to proceed with assisted reproductive technology. In general, I think many, many clinicians first find out from patients with endometriosis whether their priority is the management of pain or their desire to conceive. If their desire is to conceive, then an infertility workup is done with measurement of ovarian reserve. And then you can see in this flow chart that you know, after the basic infertility workup, uh, there is either paths that lead to surgery or paths that lead to ART. This again is from the De Ziegler review article. So we wanna talk more about this flowchart or particular instances in this, where patients with endometriosis related infertility may either uh, be counseled to undergo surgery or to have ART. So the question for today is, what is the standard first line treatment for endometriosis related infertility, surgery or ART? And do, do certain patient characteristics make one approach superior for an individual patient? So with this, I hand over, uh, or like I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Bruce Lassie again, he will talk about the topic of endometriosis, an unrecognized cause of IVF failure. So I hand over the control to him. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. In the past, when I was working in Greenville, South Carolina, I was doing a lot of uh, surgery for endometriosis. And I, at that time, thought that that was the way to go. And now I'm in Winston-Salem doing a lot of IVF and a high success program and have come to the conclusion that, that ART also has a role to play. But still, given even highest, the highest success rates around the country, there are still women that fail IVF for unknown reasons, even with euploid embryo transfers. And the decision needs to be made what to do with them. So I think this is a very timely uh, webinar and one I'm pleased to participate in. Let's see if I can advance. I do have some disclosures to make, including the uh, developed technology for Receptiva and being on the advisory board for Myovan. So the definition, definitions for recurrent implantation failure are unfortunately ill-defined as uh, outlined in this reference that I show here. In that paper, there, are, there is a table showing many, many different uh, suggestions for what recurrent implantation might include, including two implantation failures up to six or more IVFs. And I think in reality, in today's IVF uh, field, one embryo, uh, one euploid embryo failure should uh, get our attention and we should be able to think about what to do in that case since those are devastating outcomes for patients, especially as they age. There have been some recent papers suggesting uh, that endometriosis uh, may be an occult reason for implantation failure. 
This paper by Steiner came out in 2019 and suggested that uh, in patients with a, a, uh, two euploid embryo failures or more would benefit from possible suppression of suspected endometriosis. And they compared uh, GnRH agonist with and without letrozole to no treatment. And they found that letrozole in addition to Lupron was superior. While I don't necessarily agree with that finding based on my own experience, I do think it's important that the idea of empiric therapy for IVF failure is one that we should consider seriously. Even though we don't have a good universally accepted definition, in common practice, we see that over time, as our IVF practices have gotten better, and these data were courtesy of Richard Scott, that when one, present, uh, when one transfers euploid embryos, you can see that we have reached a plateau in our ability to help patients conceive. And this is sustained implantation rate, reaching about two thirds of patients. And when one considers the 200,000 cycles per year in the United States, that's a lot of patients who fail to get pregnant. And we should have a plan on what to do with those people. The question of whether endometriosis causes IVF failure um, has been of some debate over the years, not to mention this paper, which was a meta-analysis in 2002 by my friend, Kirk Barnhart. And in that study, they show very little impact of endometriosis on overall ART success. One large grain of salt that I think we should take when we consider these data is that all of these patients with an endometriosis diagnosis have already been diagnosed. And studies show that 90% of patients that undergo laparoscopy for endometriosis receive treatment either in the form of resection of endometriosis or subsequently uh, suppression of endometriosis. So these patients in fact are not similar to the kinds of patients that come into our IVF practice who don't have a diagnosis of endometriosis, but in fact do carry the disease. So endometriosis is, is the elephant in the room when it comes to IVF. I think it's the most common cause of IVF failure. It's a major cause of IBS and uh, interstitial cystitis. It's chronic and recurring. And again, there's little, in, little consensus on its impact in IVF, mostly because of the reasons I cited with that meta-analysis. When one looks at recurrent implantation failure uh, with regards to uh, habitual abortion, uh, about half of those patients are unexplained. And the other reasons are listed on this slide on the right. But when you look at the unexplained uh, patients, and uh, we rarely do laparoscopy on these, these women, but when you use biological markers, non-invasive markers of endometriosis, we're finding that almost 80% of these patients have signs of endometriosis based on endometrial changes. And the reasons these uh, biological markers are important is that they tell us something about why these patients are having recurrent implantation failure. In the normal woman with receptive endometrium as shown on the left, progesterone is able to act and its main function is to turn down estrogen receptors and decidualize the stroma. In the setting of inflammation associated with hydrosalpinx endometriosis or endometritis, we can <clears throat> see elevation in the markers CERT1 and BCL6, which directly target this progesterone pathway, leading to progesterone resistance and thus increased estrogen signaling and proliferation, which is, does not go along with uterine receptivity. When we look at patients with euploid embryo transfers for, for one of these bio, biomarkers, CERT1, you can see on the right that 74 out of 27 patients with unexplained IVF failure 
after a single euploid embryo transfer. 74% tested positive. On the left side, you can see what happens when we treated those patients. In the middle, when we treated those patients with Lupron, 80 plus percent have ongoing pregnancies, whereas less than, well, about 20% uh, had ongoing pregnancies if no treatment was given. Interestingly, those who tested negative also were not treated and had a poor prognosis for future transfers. So our approach in my, uh, my current approach with my partner, Jeff Deaton, we take a good history. We look for strong and subtle signs of endometriosis. We ask if there's any history of recurrent pregnancy loss. And we ask if we find out if their infertility is unexplained, which is usually a red flag. We perform endometrial biopsies now at the time of retrieval. And we're finding a surprising number of patients have endometritis that can then be treated prior to transfer. These are patients that are doing PGT and delaying the transfer of embryos. We look for adenomyosis on ultrasound. If we think there's a reason to do this, we biopsy women with IVF failure for euploid embryo transfer. We send sometimes for ERA, but for receptiva. And if they uh, look like they might have endometriosis, we can modify the timing of transfer or treat them with Lupron for two months or offer surgery if their symptoms uh, suggest uh, that they might benefit from that approach. One of the problems with surgery that I found and, and also in find, find now in referring my patients to other surgeons is that often surgeons do not recognize the depth of the lesions. This red lesion might be lasered, but in fact, it was a very deep uh, nodule uh, that uh, required a deep resection to get rid of it. So surgery often leaves endometriosis behind. Trying to, okay. So the pros and cons of these, of medical management, medical management for these patients with suspected endometriosis, uh, it takes two months and it has some side effects. Surgery is immediate. The surgeons nowadays may be less likely to recognize and remove all lesions. Surgery has more risks. Surgery provides a certain diagnosis and then empiric management. But in good hands, we have published uh, by Likes et al. in JARG in 19, uh, 2019 that laparoscopy and medical suppression work equally well uh, for patients with unexplained implantation failure. I'll stop there and yield to, my, uh, to, to the next speaker. Great, thank you, Dr. Lessie. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, I thank Alex, I thank ASRM for inviting me to give a surgical perspective on the treatment of endometriosis-related infertility. So I, I hope this talk is practical. I mean, part of my goal here is to talk a little bit about surgery for, for endometriosis, but also talk about surgeries that are related to endometriosis, but can hopefully help with patients who are undergoing fertility treatments. Um, you know, what are the reasons for surgery? You know, clearly if somebody is symptomatic, if they have severe dysmenorrhea or, or worsening chronic pelvic pain, and if there's infertility associated with that, then it makes sense that surgery might be an option, especially in areas where access to ART is not available, or perhaps in places where um, um, it isn't covered and, and surgery is, and, and it might provide a benefit in those situations. And then for those patients who are undergoing infertility treatments, um, where there is some hindrance to their ability to go through an IVF cycle, or perhaps there's some concern about pathology that would hinder implantation, then I think in those situations, surgery um, is, is a reasonable option. So what about laparoscopy for minimal disease? You know, what we call stage one or stage two disease based on the revised ASRM classification, which is still the gold standard classification for endometriosis. You know, initially the data was a little bit complex. Um, they, it wasn't very consistent. You know, Marco is the classic study from 1997 where he showed that if you go in and, and excise these, these lesions, there was an improvement in fertility rates. 
Um, a couple of years later, Perizzini came out and showed that maybe that wasn't the case. Nevertheless, there is a recent Cochrane database review. Um, the number of qualifying studies is relatively small, but overall, when you look at all stages of endometriosis, doing surgery does seem to help with natural conception, as you can see here on this forest plot. And to sort of stress this even more, you know, Dr. Addis Adamson really did a nice job in 2010, really trying to develop a classification system that would be prognostic for fertility. Um, so he came up with these, this endometriosis fertility index, which factors in not only the staging of disease based on the um, ASRM classification, but also factored in patient age, duration of fertility, whether or not the patient had a pregnancy before, but more importantly, um, allowed the surgeon to identify the amount of pathology based on what was seen at the tubes, at the fimbria, and at the ovary, and come up with the score. Um, and as you can see here on this bottom graph, um, you know, surgery overall had an improvement, but clearly there was an improvement that were much better when the patient had a better prognostic um, uh, characteristics, or if the disease was, was more minimal versus more severe. Now for patients who have endometriosis who have ongoing pelvic pain or worsening dysmenorrhea, I'm always concerned that if I put this patient through an ART cycle, you know, are, are her symptoms going to worsen? I know a lot of patients have that fear as well. Um, and, and looking at the same Cochrane database from a couple of years ago, once again, the, the qualifying studies was, was, was only one, but nevertheless, you can see that when you go in and do surgery and you excise the lesions in particular, it does favor surgery as far as reducing the amount of pelvic pain. So for patients who are considering fertility treatments who come in to see you and are quite symptomatic, I do think it's reasonable for those patients to consider doing surgery to minimize any long-term long pain, especially for patients who are gonna go through ART treatments. Now, one of the concerns we have with endometriomas, of course, is that if we go in and do surgery, we're running the risk of, 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 of injuring the ovary, but we also have concerns about leaving them in place. And the concern we have is, okay, if I have an endometrioma on an ovary, am I gonna get um, enough oocytes from that ovary? Are the oocytes gonna be of good quality? Is it gonna form good embryos? This is a nice study by Suzuki who broke, patients in, bro broke down patients into three groups. Group A are patients who have endometriomas. Um, group B are patients who had endometriosis, but no endometriomas. And group C is the control group, patients who had um, only tubal factor infertility. And as you can see here, patients with endometrio endometriosis definitely had fewer eggs that were retrieved, but overall their fertilization rate, their implantation rate, and their clinical live birth rates um, were very, very similar. So that's very, very encouraging. So if you have endometriomas that are there and the patient is relatively asymptomatic and you feel comfortable that you're gonna have some access to the ovaries, um, then I think it's reasonable in these situations to consider doing ART first. Now, when I was training as a fellow, we were always taught that if you put a needle inadvertently into an endometrioma, you had to change out that needle, that somehow the endometriotic fluid was, was harmful to the egg, would create um, poor embryos. This is a small retrospective study that seems to refute this. Um, the number of patients was 14, but when you look at those patients where an endometrioma was punctured, um, they didn't change out the needle, and when they compared it to control groups, you can see that the fertilization rate and the number of good quality embryos was, was basically the same. Now, of course, endometriomas, we always worry that if we inadvertently puncture an endometrioma during an egg retrieval, that we're setting up that patient for a tubo ovarian abscess. And it makes sense, right? You have a, a confined space with old blood. It's a nice culture environment for bacteria that you bring in with your needle through the vaginal vault, you're gonna end up with an infection. Um, thankfully, overall, the, the risk for tubo ovarian abscess seems to be below. Um, this is a study from, from Bengalia from a few years back, looking at 119 patients with endometriomas, six of which um, the endometrioma was punctured. No patients developed tubo ovarian abscess. Now, they were only followed for two months, and this is important because a study that was done several years later in France showed that tubo ovarian abscesses after an oocyte retrieval can occur many days, if not many weeks, 
after the egg retrieval is performed. And in fact, in our center, we had a tubal ovarian abscess that developed in a woman who had an egg retrieval with an inadvertent puncture of the endometrioma that actually manifested itself in the third trimester of pregnancy, um, causing um, issues. So it can happen even several months after the egg retrieval. Now, interestingly, in this study, they also realized that patients who have endometriomas may also spontaneously develop tubal ovarian abscesses, which makes study of this, of, this, of this area somewhat complicated. But overall, the risk for tubal ovarian abscesses seems to be low, even if you inadvertently get into an endometrioma. Now, some of the suggestions to minimize that risk, if you don't give antibiotics at the time of the retrieval, perhaps this is an opportunity to give a patient some broad spectrum antibiotics. If you give antibiotics already, perhaps you extend the duration of antibiotics, maybe start it um, if you know in advance that they have an endometrioma, start it the day before, maybe continue for a few days afterwards to try to provide more comprehensive coverage. Um, if you're someone who only does saline rinses of, of the vagina prior to an egg retrieval, and you know someone has an endometrioma, maybe this is an opportunity to consider a betadine um, rinse of the vagina followed by a saline rinse to try to minimize the amount of vaginal flora. Of course, endometriosis, endometriosis is an inflammatory disease and inflammation can cause um, impact on the fallopian tube. So if you see a hydro or a hematosalpinx, especially if you see it on ultrasound, we know that there's at least a 50% reduction in clinical pregnancy rates and a twofold increase in pregnancy loss. And if you do a salpingectomy, or if you disconnect the tubes from the uterus in these patients, um, their success rates improve. So in these situations, if they have endometriosis and it's affecting the tubes, I think it makes sense clearly to consider doing surgery. Now there are times where due to the inflammation of the endometriosis, the ovary is positioned in a way that you can't access through a transvaginal egg retrieval approach. Um, if you can do it transabdominally, great, but there are times where you can't even access the ovary transabdominally. It's up high on the uterus, maybe it's a little bit behind it and you can access it through either approach. Now this is a situation where per perhaps performing a laparoscopy and either trying to move that ovary deeper into the cul-de-sac or bringing it up higher on the lateral pelvic side wall might give you access to, to the ovary through, um, through either a vaginal or transabdominal approach. Now, if you have to do this transabdominally, um, there's good studies looking at this. This is from my colleagues um, here in Boston where they looked at transabdominal versus transvaginal. Um, yes, you will get fewer eggs, but overall the fertilization rates and the clinical ongoing pregnancy rates are very, very good and very comparable to the transvaginal approach. Now, one of the concerns about doing surgery, especially on endometriomas, is that you will compromise ovarian function. This is regardless of any cyst that you remove, but in particular with endometriomas, which are very inflammatory. These cysts are not easy to remove. Um, and you can see here in this very nice paper, when you look at both unilateral and bilateral cystectomies, you will see diminished um, AMHs. And you can see with the unilateral cystectomies, you can get decreases up to 30 or 40%. And with bilateral cystectomies, over 50% reduction in AMHs, and these levels persist for at least 12 months. Um, so this is one of the reasons where if we can avoid surgery, um, uh, we try to do it. But as, I, as I'm stating here, there are situations where you might, may not have a choice and you're forced to do um, a laparoscopic cystectomy. And in those situations, um, one of the options you have is to consider instead of removing the cyst to do what's called a de-roofing technique. And this has been studied um, here in this study. This is a randomized controlled trial looking at 60 patients. These are cysts that were between three and eight centimeters. So these are fairly large cysts. Um, and when you look at the group that had the cyst removed and you compare it to the group where there was a de-roofing where part of the cyst was removed, but a CO2 laser was used to vaporize the layer of endometriotic cells on, on the cyst itself, you can see looking at these ovarian function parameters, antral follicle count and serum AMH, it was definitely uh, much less compromised when you did the de-roofing and CO2 laser technique versus the cystectomy. Um, so this is an option. Clearly, if you're worried about the endometriomas getting in the way um, of your ovarian re uh, retrieval to maybe do a more conservative approach. Now, one of the concerns we have is that by doing this, there's probably also a higher risk for recurrence of these cysts in these patients 
Um, but that's often a compromise that many patients are willing to take if it means better access to their ovaries for the retrieval. Now, another procedure that's been getting a little bit of press recently over the last couple of years is this concept of doing an endometrioma cyst aspiration. Um, this is a nice study that we did um, several years ago. Um, this is a randomized controlled trial. Um, we looked at 22 patients with stage three endometriosis. The surgery was done at least 12 months prior to their first IVF cycle who had a recurrence of an endometrioma. And these endometriomas were between three to 10 centimeters in diameter. Um, and these are patients who are embryo banking. So these are patients where we did their first IVF cycle without any cyst aspiration. They came back and did their second cycle and we aspirated the cyst um, the month prior to starting OCPs, birth control pills as part of the treatment protocol. Um, and 10 patients had a saline aspiration only, 12 patients had an ethanol, 95% ethanol sclerosis. Um, and you can see here that the recurrence rates in both groups um, were present um, definitely a lot better with the 95% ethanol sclerosis, but still overall um, low in both groups. And, and, and one of the nice things about doing this is that even though there's, there was a recurrence, these cysts tended, tended to be smaller than the actual original cyst size. So it made access to the ovaries much better. And you can see that in the, um, the number of oocytes that were retrieved, um, clearly much better post-aspiration um, and better with the ethanol um, sclerosis um, um, group. So this is a technique that you can consider. It's worked well for us. We, we continue to do this in patients, particularly those who've had multiple surgeries on their ovaries or, or we know who have really um, pronounced severe disease and we're reluctant to go in and do surgery uh, for fear of, of, of higher complication rates. This is a nice technique to consider. So to bring this back, bring this back to the beginning, you know, what are the reasons for surgery? Clearly, if you have someone who has infertility, or maybe ART is not an option for them or access is poor, um, laparoscopic surgery is an option to try to enhance their, their, their reproductive op, um, opportunities. And then for those patients who are going through an, um, ART um, and you're having some difficulties due to endometriomas or hydrocalpinges, or the ovary needs to be moved into a location that can be retrieved, surgery um, seems to be a reasonable option. I'll hand this over back to Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. So we move on, if I get the control back, uh, to the case examples and the Q&A section of this session. So um, to summarize sort of in general terms, we learned from Dr. Lessi that a lot of the cases of unexplained or sort of unexplained recurrent implantation failure may be due to endometriosis. And that maybe in some of these cases, medical treatment uh, may be beneficial. We also learned from Dr. Petroza regarding um, the indications for surgery, uh, some of the challenges associated with endometriomas. And now we wanna go into some cases uh, so uh, the overall question of this webinar is in patients who are trying to conceive and have endometriosis of maybe varying severity, what is the best first line treatment? And this is now where the audience also will get involved because we're going to look at some case examples and try to decide with our experts, but also with your input, what is the best management of each of the patients that we're gonna go over. So we were uh, talking about the relationship of endometriosis and infertility then at the two talks, and now we're gonna go into the uh, case discussion. So this is now the management, and I showed you this flow chart earlier, and now we're gonna do the practical part of this. So case one, a 35-year-old G0 with two years of primary unexplained infertility, which Dr. Lassie said was a red flag, who had done three attempts of Clomid plus IUI. She has painful periods, but no other classic symptoms, so not the other three Ds uh, of uh, endometriosis, no dyspareunia, dysuria, or dyskesia. 
Her AMH is robust at 3.4 nanograms per milliliters. So this is now where the first pole comes in. So this is the um, audience response question. So what management would you recommend to this patient? And I would like you to just pick one option. Laparoscopy with or without removal of endometriosis. So basically with removal of endometriosis if found. And then three to 12 months of uh, attempting natural conception followed by then IVF if not pregnant. Second option, standard IVF. Third option, IVF with three months of GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. And I realize that these are very specific options, but if you had to choose one of these three options, uh, what would you do for this patient? Okay, so 75% of the audience would do standard IVF. Second choice, laparoscopy, 19%. And then a very small percentage, 6% of the audience would do IVF with three months of GnRH agonist pretreatment. Okay, well, um, maybe let's ask our experts. Um, Dr. Petroza, if one of these choices, what would you have done? Well, I'm biased. I live in a mandated state, Alex. So, you know, I, I probably would have pushed this patient toward IVF at this point after having failed several cycles of, of IUIs. You know, her symptoms are there, but they're not um, to the point where they're causing what seems to be a lot of dysfunction. So I'm not worried about worsening of her disease and her symptoms during ART. However, you know, if I was in a place where perhaps ART is not accessible or the patient can't afford IVF, um, I don't think it's unreasonable with this patient to consider a laparoscopy. And one of the nice things about endometriosis is that we're getting better and better and better with our diagnostic techniques, um, meaning the radiologic techniques, you know, whether an MRI can be helpful. Um, there are some nice um, classification processes for diagnosing with MRIs and even diagnosing with ultrasounds. And, and people who do this routinely are very, very good at picking up endometriotic lesions with these, with these tools. And so that would be something I would consider if someone is considering surgery. Um, but yeah, I think overall, you know, if, if the patient had access to ART, I probably would move forward with IVF first. Excellent. Dr. Lassie. Yeah, I, I agree. The, um, the mandated IVF is an important issue. I work at a place that covers IVF for our employees. It's a large hospital system. And uh, yet we have teachers who don't have IVF coverage. And I could clearly see myself pushing laparoscopy in a patient who would struggle to pay for IVF, whereas I would be more likely to recommend IVF and embryo banking uh, in the patient who has coverage, because then if she happens to fail, then we could either go back to the idea of doing laparoscopy or uh, treat with Lupron at that point for suspected endometriosis. But I can see both sides of the issue as well. Wonderful. Well, we'll go next uh, to the next case. So this is a 38-year-old Gravita Zero with one year of primary infertility. On ultrasound, we see a suspected two by three centimeter endometrioma on the left ovary. She has bilateral proximal blockage of the fallopian tubes on HSG and her AMH is on the lower side at 0.9 nanograms per milliliters. So here are uh, the questions you will see come up on the screen in a moment. Our A, laparoscopy with ovarian cystectomy and removal of all visible endometriosis followed by standard IVF. So remove the endometrioma, remove all endometriosis and then do standard IVF. Second option, laparoscopy with ovarian cystectomy, remove all visible Oh, that's the same one. Actually, uh, it should. I think it should say um, IVF with uh, GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. Sorry, um, that um, didn't copy over well. So let's just uh, pretend that the second option is to do the same as number one. Uh, 
but also do the GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. So analogous to the fourth option, because the third option is just to do standard IVF. And then the fourth option is to do IVF with GnRH agonist pretreatment. So just to make it clear one more time, first option, surgery, remove the endometrioma, remove all endometriosis, and then do standard IVF. Second option is arguably the most extensive option because you do laparoscopy, remove the endometrioma, remove all endometriosis, then do Lupron or some GnRH agonist pretreatment and then um, before the transfer after standard IVF. Third option, standard IVF, and then fourth option, IVF with GnRH agonist pretreatment. Now you can vote if you're not confused. <laughs> Okay, so this time the fourth option got the most votes. Um, and basically, that is IVF with GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. So, no surgery. So, overall, uh, you know, the one way you can see this, um, uh, and I don't see the results anymore now, but uh, if we can bring up the results one more time, there you go. Uh, one uh, way you can see it is that 71% of the voting uh, audience said that we should not operate on this patient. We should either do standard IVF, that was 18%, or the majority of people said do IVF and then GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. Uh, the minority of, pay, of, of audience uh, that voted, of the audience that voted, that was 30%, said we should operate. And of those that said we should operate, uh, those said then after the surgery, it should also, the, the patient should also be treated with a GnRH agonist before the transfer. So now we have the question. I think this time we should ask Dr. Lassie first. Yeah, I think this patient um, deserves to do standard IVF. And the reason I say that is, um, her endometriomas aren't big enough to operate on. She doesn't have pain. And the AMH is low enough to be concerned about doing surgery. Um, if you only have one embryo at the end of the day that turns out to be euploid, maybe at that point I would treat her with Lupron before I do the transfer, but I might wait and find out how many high quality embryos I get before making that decision. Excellent. John, Dr. Petrozo? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I think standard IVF is probably what we would do. As Dr. Leslie said, the endometrium is small enough that I don't think it would be interfering uh, with access to the ovary. And that's one of the things we always gauge when patients are coming in for their antral follicle scans. We're also trying to determine, are there, gonna, are there gonna be any issues with access to the ovaries? But I don't think that would be the case. And even if it was, you know, we would, we would probably try IVF and see how they do and see how she responded on the opposite ovary and see if we got enough eggs from that side as well. Great, and of course, uh, it's that prox proximal blockage. Uh, as we saw in your talk, uh, John, uh, if she had a hydrosalpings, then maybe that would change your management. That's absolutely correct. So that, that, that would be a game changer for me. So if she had evidence of a hydrosalpings, um, I think that would be an indication for surgery. Excellent. I think we have one more. There it is. Okay, now we have a 41-year-old Gravida Zero with pelvic pain and infertility. The exam shows or demonstrates nodularity in the rectovaginal septum. The MRI shows suspected deep infiltrating endometriosis, and her AMH is... I would say age appropriate, uh, maybe even a little bit on the higher side for a 41 year old at 1.2. So uh, this time, I think the answers are actually spelled out correctly. Uh, what management would you recommend to this patient? Laparoscopy with removal of all visible endometriosis then standard IVF. Second option, laparoscopy. So again, the first two options are surgery. The third and fourth option are IVF. 
And uh, the second and fourth option include the GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. So first option, surgery, standard IVF. Second option, surgery, IVF with GnRH agonist pretreatment. Third, standard IVF. And then fourth, IVF with GnRH agonist pretreatment prior to transfer. All right, let's see. Obviously, to a certain extent, these questions are, you know, there's uh, so many factors like the surgical experience. You know, this, this is a case of potential deep infiltrating and endometriosis. Not everybody is willing to take that on. You need the surgical expertise for it. Anyway, so the audience voted, uh, like, so there's actually equal numbers of uh, participants in this poll uh, that would uh, use a GnRH agonist uh, pretreatment. Half of those, or, or like, you know, essentially 42% each, either with laparoscopy, uh, followed by uh, removal of all visible endometriosis. So essentially the, the sort of largest package where you do surgery, remove all endometriosis, then do IVF with pre GnRH agonist pretreatment. 42% would, in this case, do IVF and then no surgery, do IVF, GnRH agonist pretreatment. So in this case, interestingly, we see a... Um, like majority of people thinking that in this setting, the GnRH agonist pretreatment is useful. And only 8% each felt like um, treatment without the GnRH agonist uh, would be uh, the right choice. Uh, in this case, we also have even numbers, exactly 50% each going for surgery first versus IVF. So now again, uh, uh, Dr. Petroza, what, uh, what, uh, what do you think? Um, you know, it really comes down, at least to me, to the amount of pain that she's having. You know, if she's having significant pain because of this deep infiltrating endometriosis, then it, then it warrants surgery. And you're absolutely right. This is going to require a skilled surgeon. Either, you know, you know, we have lots of great reproductive surgeons out there who could tackle this. Um, and and this, is, this is very involved, right? These type of deep infiltrating lesions are difficult to get to. Um, you often have to go in retroperitoneal. There's risk associated with that. So the Pelvic pain would be the primary reason to do this. If she wasn't in a lot of pain, if it was manageable at 41, I probably would, would focus on trying to get her through IVF and trying to get some eggs and embryos generated. Excellent. Dr. Lessie? I totally agree. Wonderful. We have uh, two agreeing, uh, agreeing panelists. All right. <laughs> wonderful. Well, <laughs> this, was, uh, this was the cases. And uh, so now, uh, uh, these were the cases. So now uh, we have the Q&A session. And so looking at uh, my uh, Q&A, uh, so we can actually go back one slide before the, yeah, there you go. Um, uh, do we have any questions yet from the audience? I don't see any as of now. Let's see. There's one. How long do you treat with Lupron if there's adenomyosis? So this goes into the question of adenomyosis. So uh, adenomyosis is often put into the same sort of category as endometriosis, even though on a molecular level, they are sort of separate entities. Uh, but oftentimes people extrapolate a lot from the treatment of endometriosis in uh, women trying to conceive uh, to the treatment of patients with adenomyosis trying to conceive. All right, so maybe Dr. Lassie, what, what do you do? Patients with adenomyosis. True adenomyosis, such as an adenomyoma, I think is a very discouraging finding. And patients typically fail IVF repeatedly, no matter what you do. Um, it is probably something you would treat uh, for longer than two months. I don't know what the right answer is, three or six, but you still might have a failure. So uh, I feel sorry for these patients. Resection of adenomyosis is very difficult. Um, and it's a very frustrating disease to treat. <laughs> 
John, do you have um, experience with treating patients with adenomyosis with uh, GnRH agonists? Um, I do. I've tried. I've tried a lot of things. I've tried GnRH agonist. I've tried letrozole. I've tried GnRH antagonist. Very, very difficult to manage. And, and those patients that we've been able to get pregnant, unfortunately, have a very, very high miscarriage rate. So overall, we're not getting the result that we want. Dr. Leslie's right. You know, there are times where I've thought about taking these patients to surgery, and clearly, if they have an adenomyoma, we have probably a little bit of a shot of trying to resect it. These are cases that probably are best done through an open laparotomy. And as much as I tend to do most of my cases minimally invasively, um, these are the cases where if you want to do a very thorough resection um, and utilize some of the techniques like OSADA, you know, the triple flap technique where you're really resecting down to the level of the endometrial cavity, um, where he's shown some pretty good success, then, then that, that's going to be an option. But it's sort of a last ditch effort, really. Agreed. Great. Um, there is actually another question related to this. Actually, two more questions. Um, so thoughts on co-treatment with letrozole and GnRH agonist. And then also the question, if adenomyosis on MRI does not affect the junctional zone and only affects diffuse foci in the myometrium, does this change your treatment? So one question about whether to use letrozole and GnRH agonists together, and then the other one about the findings on MRI and how that impacts your decision whether to treat or not. Is that directed toward me, Alex? Yes. Okay, sorry, so you, you may have said that, sorry. Um, no, no, I didn't say that yet. I just put it out there. And, <laughs> you know, I, if you have a good answer to it, or I mean, this is a, these are difficult questions uh, because I think that a lot of these are where we're still waiting for better data to come in. Uh, but yeah, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, it, it, if, if it's, you know, what is the junctional zone, right? I think a lot of people say, what is the junctional zone? You know, is it just a radiologic characteristic or is it something that's real? Um, it, it comes down to the patient's symptoms. You know, if the patient is bleeding heavy, to me, that somehow is affecting her, her endometrium and her ability for implantation to occur. And so I, I really focus on, on the symptoms more so than what I'm seeing on the MRI and whether or not it's affecting the, junk, the, the junctional zone. Excellent. Dr. Lassie? So the question of whether to add letrozole, is that what the, the question was? Yes, Luke? let's answer that one too, yeah. I, I was surprised that the Steiner paper saw such a difference, but then their overall success rate was only 42%. Um, we typically get 60 to 70% pregnancy rate. So um, maybe that's why with Lupron alone, we're getting 80% because we're already doing pretty well. Uh, but I don't, I don't use letrozole in addition to, to uh, Lupron and maybe in patients who fail, that would be the next step. Yeah, I think a lot of these things are sort of extrapolating and extrapolating again, because I mean, there were like definitely good data about uh, patients uh, pre-treating them with uh, Lupron in endometriosis, that that may in increase the life birth rate in patients with endometriosis. But then, for example, you extrapolate from that to adenomyosis, and then you extrapolate from GnRH agonists to letrozole. Uh, and so some of these uh, things haven't really been studied very well. The, the real question is, could letrozole be used without Lupron? Yeah, we, that's we, what I mean. Like, some, yeah. I, like I've seen that done instead. And uh, the question is, is it the same exact uh, efficacy? We used letrozole for only five days during IVF and improved uh, cycle fecundity, a paper by Miller uh, et al. a while back. And so it's interesting molecule and one that deserves more study, I think. Excellent. Now there is a question that is sort of shifting gears a little bit from the question about GnRH agonist uh, or letrozole treatment and also from adenomyosis. Uh, so, Dr. Lassie, in recurrent implantation failure in phase three, you mentioned the different phases in your practice, you do a biopsy for ERA and receptiva. Do you notice any difference in the ERA result with patients with endometriosis? Well, ERA is not a test that uh, detects endometriosis. So, I suppose, based on their own literature, I would say no. Uh, 
Okay. We don't, my partner uses ERA more than I do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess the question was whether there's more out of phase or like more pre-receptive and post-receptive results in patients with endometriosis. That's not we've, your experience. We've seen patients that are way out of phase and still have normal ERAs. We have patients that are in phase and have out of phase ERAs. Uh, it's hard to, hard to say what it means. Wonderful. Here we go. Next question. Recognized international pathological diagnosis of endometritis versus culture versus hysteroscopy appearance. Do you have a publication, Dr. Lassie? Well, we are currently working on this because, um, you know, and, and, um, endometritis can be diagnosed with uh, one or two plasma cells. I think people are saying you need more than two. There are stains, CD138. And uh, I think the whole area needs to be looked at closely. Um, in the patients that we're biopsying, where we're seeing endometritis, usually our pathologist requires genuine endometritis with lots of plasma cells and positive either MUM1 or CD138 staining of those plasma cells. Excellent. Does anybody know data regarding two versus three months of Depo-Lupron? Because, I mean, I think you mentioned, Dr. Lessie, that you give two months of Lupron. That's what we do. It seems to work pretty well. <laughs> we also don't let patients menstruate, and that may be an important factor. If you do two months of Lupron and then bring a person back to cycling before you eventually transfer them, you've negated much of the benefit by allowing them to menstruate. So it's my opinion, you should do the Lupron and go straight into FET transfer without having a period. Sounds great. This is a question for Dr. Petroza, I think. There was a slide that said four centimeters is the size of an endometrioma in which surgery would be recommended over going the ART or medical route. What if the ovaries are accessible and the patient is not having many pain symptoms? Do you still do surgery first? No, I would do the retrieval first. It's all about access. Yeah, I think a lot of those numbers were based on patient inclusion into the, uh, into the studies. And ASRM guidelines. And ASRM guidelines, yeah. So you wouldn't sort of necessarily use a size cutoff? No, it's, it's really just an access issue for me. But at four centimeters, you know, you have to really start to think about it. You know, do you have access and do everything you can? There's nothing worse than putting a patient through an IVF cycle with endometriomas and you, you can't get to them. <laughs> nothing worse than that. So um, do your due diligence. Agree. Excellent. Then we have another excellent question. I think this might be the final question. What about local overexpression of aromatase and HSD? So higher estradiol versus estro in utopic endometrium and possible associated progesterone resistance. This sounds like it's a question for you, Dr. Lassie, that would not be addressed with the GnRH agonists. Well, I mean, that, that's a phenomenon that has been characterized that menstrual uh, lavage or menstrual fluid contains elevated levels of estrogen. And it's probably, be, probably because of those uh, enzymes. But that's part and parcel of progesterone resistance. And the, the same molecules are involved. Inflammation leads to progesterone resistance and overexpression of estrogen. So I think it's all part of the same story. And I'm not sure it it doesn't all get better if you suppress it. Excellent. I think these were all the questions. I think this was a fabulous uh, webinar. Uh, my dad always used to say, we are still confused, but on a higher level. Uh, <laughs> that's always a good thing to say at the end of a discussion like this. Uh, well, I thank you both uh, very much. Um, it was very interesting. I hope for the audience, definitely was for me. And I think uh, this pretty much concludes our webinar. Thank you both so much. And um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, ASRM webinar on endometriosis and infertility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quas, Dr. Petros, and Dr. Lassie. This was a fantastic webinar and engaging discussion.
Um, and to the attendees, thank you for joining us. You will receive a survey right after the session and by email after the session. And your feedback helps us give you the most relevant information uh, and your input is appreciated. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please watch our email for notification about future webinars. For any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at ASRM.org. I have dropped that um, email address in the chat as well. This concludes the webinar. Good night or good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much.